welcome to our world in 2050. This is the world as we now know it. A world where policymakers and corporations are also citizens. A world where investors are also conscious consumers. Where corporations have sustainability in their DNA. Where each citizen is a stakeholder. It's hard to imagine, but at the beginning of the 21st century, there were climate deniers. Profitability had a more short-term notion, and harm to our oceans and forests were considered an inevitable externality, but mostly ignored altogether. So what triggered the change? This is 2021, the second year of COVID-19. The pandemic forced the world to come to a near stop. People experienced a cleaner world, a quieter world. Consumers and retail investors emerged as a leading force in driving change, followed by corporations, cities and governments, all committing to ambitious pledges to create a net zero world. ESG became mainstream. The UN convened Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, an international group of 33 asset owners representing over 5 trillion US dollars in AUM, committed to transitioning their portfolios to net zero GHG emissions by 2050. But were developing countries included in this movement? In 2021, the world was at a crossroads. One direction was to deepen the divide between developed and emerging markets with ESG ratings that didn't reflect realities in emerging markets. The other, to create inclusive ESG frameworks and standards. The world took the inclusive route. Institutional and retail investors, government and corporate leaders collaborated to ensure ESG frameworks were equitable and inclusive for everybody everywhere. Technology sped up the implementation, helping smaller companies to provide ESG reporting. A mix of public scrutiny, self-discipline, and regulatory oversight kept greenwashing in check. Through collective innovation, the world changed for the better. Sustainably so. FII Institute proudly empowers the world's brightest minds to shape a brighter future for all and with all. Welcome to the Neo Renaissance, mobilizing ESG for a sustainable future. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this live virtual event, Mobilizing ESG for a Sustainable Future. This, of course, is an initiative by the FII Institute, and this is the inaugural ESG event by the Institute. So we're absolutely delighted that you're here and that you've joined us. This is where we're going to be looking at environmental, social and governance and really talking to key leaders from around the world in terms of what they're doing about it, how it's working, and what more do we need to do. I'm Athna Trainer, and I'm going to be with you for the next two hours to help guide you through, so I'm delighted to be here. We have 25 speakers and moderators, and they're really going to bring this debate on ESG to an entire new level. We, of course, want to engage, inform, educate, and hopefully inspire you to take action. That's what we would love to see. And we do, of course, want you to be engaged with us. Now, as we heard in that opening video, it really is no longer a question if ESG is valuable, if it adds value, if it's essential, if it advances the green economy, if it actually makes sense to advance ad investors. That story is over. This now is about how we actually maximize the impact of ESG. And it really is about really taking this as part of your license to operate. So we all need to be paying a lot more attention. Now, a key question among many others that we're going to cover, of course, in the sessions today will be, 
Um, ESG standards, the frameworks and their applications, and the realities of the markets and the realities of how they work in all markets, not just developed markets, but also in emerging markets and developing markets. There's been a lot of activity, of course, in this area, particularly in 2020. So let's get a bit of a quick update and see you know, how ESG, let's look at that global platform and just see how it has been looking. When we look at the assets in the sustainable funds, um, we'll get an infographic up here and we'll now sort of have a look at what it is. We've had a record 1.7 trillion and we've really seen there up 50% in uh, just the last year alone. So, I mean, things are on the move without a doubt. You know, we're now going to maybe take a look at this and see on the 10-year period. So we're looking at 2011 all the way really up to 2020. And again, we're really seeing this escalate and we're seeing it move almost fourfold. So again, good news in the market without a doubt. So this is very good indication. Here now we're looking at rebranding. So, you know, assets rebranding. So we don't want you to get too excited on this because yes, Europe is definitely leading the way, but this isn't about rebranding. And America and Asia have a lot to do. And on that global map, you can really see it very, very clearly there in terms of the big focus I think for the next few years will be on Asia and America. But the wonderful thing is, you know, yes, there's so much to be done, but there's tremendous opportunity that uh, is there for everybody to actually catch up and really look at what everybody needs to do in ESG. So we're delighted to see everybody online. We have more than 2,500 people registered. So this is just wonderful. And indeed, for more than 110 countries around the world. So we're very excited that you're all here with us. And of course, we're on our own platform here. We're also live streaming. And for those of you on the platform, you have maybe an added value here to perhaps engage with us. And just let us know where you're coming in from, what you think about what's going on here, what the speakers are talking about. We'd love to hear from you. And we will be running polls later, so I really want to keep you engaged and make sure that we get your opinion. See what's on your mind when it comes to ESG. You know, we're all living it on a day-to-day -day level. So what's your company doing and what are your leaders doing? So it'll be interesting to do that. So lots of thoughts too on social media. This is something that we'll really want from you as well. So there's the hashtags up there. We'll be reminding you right throughout the sessions. So they're all there. We have a very busy two hours ahead. So really let's get started. And I'm absolutely delighted now to introduce you to our opening speaker. We are without a doubt delighted he is here with us, of course, today, the CEO of the FII Institute, Richard Etias. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome back to the FII Institute virtual series. First of all, I would like to wish to all our friends who are celebrating the holy months of Ramadan all over the world, Ramadan Karim. As we continue to battle a global pandemic, we need also to rethink our approach to sustainability. I personally think that sustainability will be one of the key challenges of the year 2021. Despite the progress achieved since the 17 SDG were adopted, achieving inclusive sustainable development remains one of the major global challenges of our time. In 2020, companies that had strong governance structures and responsible social policies in place demonstrated greater resilience. This accelerated the rate of ESG integration and enhanced the quantity and quality of ESG disclosure around the world. Commitment to disclosing ESG performances remains generally low. In 2021, we need to build more sustainable markets and ensure that economic activities align more consistently with the SDGs. Harmonizing sustainability frameworks and standards, improving, improvising sorry, ESG rating transparency and consistency. We at the Future Investment Initiative Institute believe that the ESG system, as it stands today, doesn't fully consider the unique environmental, social, and economic realities, challenges, and stage of development of emerging markets. We believe that market nuances, 
including varying value systems and political realities, need to be considered when judging the ESG performance, risk exposure, and sustainability progress of companies within the context of their operating environment. The lack of a truly inclusive and equitable ESG system is a challenge to global sustainable development and inclusive growth. As participation in a non-inclusive system is likely to remain low. So today, we call on all stakeholders to engage so that the current ESG system can evolve into an inclusive system. And I really hope that this global conversation during the next two hours will be as productive as possible to move forward on the ESG issue. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome on stage His Excellency Yasser Umayyan, Governor of the Public Investment Fund of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Chairman of our FII Institute. Yes, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. Um, and from Madan Mubarak to all. Welcome to the FII Institute series, the companion of our annual FII. With this second edition, we continue to generate ideas and take them from thinking and to doing. Action is crucial as the world begins to emerge from COVID. But what is the path from rescue to lasting economic and social recovery? This debate has been underway for some time. Our 2020 series, Do Not Forget Our Planet and Near Renaissance, theme explored green recovery. Our takeaway is that recovery calls for a restart and ESG environmental, social and governance performance can guide a truly global endeavor. But business as usual cannot bring rebirth. That's why I believe ESG is so important for rethinking how economies and societies intersect. Of course, many of us rightly say that ESG is not new. Good stewardship, fair treatment and giving back have long guided great organizations. But post pandemic, ESG ensures that investments are vetted for responsibility, fairness and transparency. What's more, ESG can open the way for policies and practices that serve people and the planet. But what does the new paradigm looks like? Under the new model, business can realign in two ways. First, by delivering positive outcomes based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And second, by resolving to help humanity without degrading nature. So how do we enable ESG? Corporations need the freedom to align their business models and investments with the requirements of host markets and communities. And to look beyond short term gains to inclusive long term returns. It's imperative that ESG frameworks and standards consider emerging market realities. Otherwise, investors risk increases such as missing high yield opportunities or not dedicating enough capital flows to accelerate economic greening. Renewable energy is a good example with the new framework to which we aspire. Saudi Arabia is facing a threefold increase in electric power demand by the year 2030 while committing to reducing emissions. So renewable energy is clearly a win-win proposition. PIF also is responsible for de developing 
70% of Saudi Arabia's renewable projects pipeline, ensuring a large scale capacity. Just last week, a great example of public private partnership between Aqua Power, the water and electricity holding company Badil, and PIF launched the 1.5 gigawatt Sudair solar power PV plant that would reduce carbon emission by a staggering 2.9 million tons annually. Our gig projects are another good example for the sustainability best practices, such as Neon recently launched the world's largest green hydrogen project that will, as well as Neon Investment Fund, which aim, both of them aim to become the global ESG leaders. And also the Red Sea Development Company aim to set global sustainability standards with projects being completely carbon neutral and powered by 100 renewable energy. Also, the government green program through regulations and fiscal spending are another ESG vehicle. Just a month ago, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman announced the Saudi Green Initiative along with the Middle East Green Initiative as part of the kingdom's climate change response. So the initiative seeks to reduce carbon emission by 60% and 50 billion trees and plant, planting 50 million trees com, complete in Saudi G20 promise on a circular carbon economy and coral reef protection. Not only does such action protect the planet, it reduces financial risk of climate changes. Sovereign wealth funds also have a role. PIF is a founding member of the One Planet, championed by the French President Emmanuel Macron, to accelerate responses to climate change and investment decisions. The working group created an initial framework to guide investments and innovations with regards to climate change, a group that has now grown to 33 financial institutions. This past year has been like no other to our collective memory. And our hearts go out to those who suffered tragedy and loss in this pandemic. In time of hardship, our challenge is not just to restore order from chaos, but to correct and improve for tomorrow with resilient business model becoming more important and more ESG financial products on the markets, there has never been a better opportunity for more sustainable future. Done right, an ESG reset can make economic more efficient, effective and inclusive. Ultimately, ESG is more than a social impact strategy. It's a business strategy. So it's critical that ESG remains true to accelerating and amplifying companies' full potential. That can only happen if we improve ESG reliability and usefulness, ensuring it's consistent and transparent. We must standardize methodologies and criteria and make underlying data available. Today, I'm pleased to announce that I've given the FII Institute a mission to create and publish a standardized ESG corporate rating methodology as a way to address these challenges. A catalyst and compass for change as well as all to seek better for our planet. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, and I wish you a productive con uh, conference. And a big thanks there to His Excellency Yasser Al-Rumayan and of course to Richard, both of you really setting the scene there. Thanks for your words of 
wisdom, encouragement, and indeed call to action here that there is still so much to do. Let's get straight to a poll. I want to hear what's on your mind and see what you're thinking about out there. And we're really going to be looking at now um, ESG standards. This is very vital here, and everybody talks about this. And you know, what do we do? How can they actually help make sure that that transition is? Yeah. When I was in Texas. So let's get that poll up, and we can see what's on your mind. And to all of you here on the platform, particularly, you can actually pay attention there and make sure we get through it. So what do we need? Is it a single standard? Do we need that one global agreement? Um, perhaps there's bias in uh, ESG ratings and definitions. What about that? Do we need alignment there? Have a think, have a look. Also, the underlying data that probably needs a little bit more attention to rather than just the top line ratings. All of these things vitally important, I know. But we're curious to know what's on your mind. And again, technology. A lot of this totally driven by technology. But really, we need to be looking at artificial collection and analysis, all of that hugely important. So lots there for you to consider. We're going to give you the results of the poll in uh, a short while. But uh, take a minute there and make sure you put in your vote, and we'll analyze it all and come back to you. So now, of course, uh, as one of the leading economies in the world, everybody is interested in the progress that's been made in China when it comes to ESG. So now let's take a, a listen to one of those companies. We're delighted to be joined um, by Longi Green Energy Technology. And the president and the CEO joins us. So let me welcome Li Chenggu. Delighted to have you here, sir.我是隆基股份的创始人李正国 构成了企业品牌主张和价值。隆基一直秉承Solar Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural uh, ESG event of the FII Institute, uh, FII Institute series. And to this very special panel, which is focusing on redefining ESG towards inclusive global sustainable development. Today, I'm very excited and pleased to announce that the FII Institute has published its first ESG report, which you can find on our website and through our social media. Today, I'm very honored to be moderating this very special session with some of the key players in the ESG space, um, including His Excellency Dr. Bandar Hajar, the President of Islamic Development Bank, Henry Fernandez, CEO and Chairman of MSCI, Ayan Adam, uh, CEO of AFC Partners, uh, AFC Capital Partners, sorry, and Rishi Kapoor, co-CEO of InvestCorp. Our speakers require no further introduction. Sir Excellency, I would like to start with you. Developing countries require a lot of capital, require to attract investments and capital to transition uh, towards a more sustainable future and achieve their sustainability sustainable development goals. So how do we bring about a differentiated approach to ESG and a, dif a differentiated application of ESG standards to uh, different markets 
and how do we also incentivize uh, developed countries uh, to move in that direction? Uh, thank you for your question. First, uh, I just want to say that it is my pleasure to be here uh, today. Developing countries uh, look forward to source the needed uh, investments to achieve their sustainable development goal. The, the danger of applying ESG criteria too strictly uh, through excluding many companies that operate in sectors where developing countries hold the comparative advantages or in countries where the business environment is such that it would be impossible to adhere the ESG principle on day one. So is that we would further deprive these countries from much needed funding. So this is not to say that ESG are not important in developing countries to give a free pass to companies uh, who operate in difficult markets. But we need really to understand the implication of excluding such companies from investment portfolios in a dynamic setting. So the ESP criteria are not unified and have no use uniformly in investment decision. So the rise of passive ESG investment may, for example, force companies to exit a developing market typically because the ESG rating it gets is low and thereby, uh, thereby affecting uh, that country's sustainability. So what does Thank you. What, Thank what does this mean to a developing world, for example, uh, failing to meet the development needs in Africa means more illegal migration across the Mediterranean and have we thought of the material and moral cost of this uh, to Europe, for instance. Also, thank you. Also. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Bender. I would like to actually bring in Henry into this uh, conversation. Just to follow up on what Dr. Bender just said, um, some emerging markets uh, which have heavy industries that tend to be uh, carbon intensive uh, receive negative uh, blanket negative scoring for their industries that are not uh, green, for that matter. Um, and the fact is, developing markets have uh, faced a, a, a more of a challenge to green their industries. And uh, and like Dr. Bender just mentioned, if we have these negative ratings uh, in these countries, the risk is the capital will flow out of these industries. So some would argue that rating agencies is um, favoring a privileged market. And, uh, and so, and others would argue that if we give special treatment to different markets, we actually give them uh, an ability to, to behave badly, if you will. So I would like to hear your perspective on that. Well, there is no question that the world is changing significantly with respect to um, environmental issues, such as, such as climate, social issues, in terms of uh, social inclusion in companies, and obviously uh, the paramount importance of uh, governance of uh, institutions uh, throughout the world. And in a, in a changing world like that, uh, there were always going to be uh, winners and losers. There will be a realignment of pricing of assets. There will be a realignment of capital allocation you know, throughout the world. So the logic of uh, only emerging markets end up you know, with certain sectors that, that get, get, get affected is not totally true. I mean, there are a lot of developed markets where major sectors of the economy, you know, will be severely affected by a lot of this uh, realignment that takes place. Um, and, uh, you know, the role of the rating agencies such as ourselves uh, is to represent the investor in identifying the material impacts that those companies will have on the valuation of the company or the bonds. So, um, so in the context of that, you know, you have to look at ESG not only as a, but also as a significant opportunity. There are a lot of companies in emerging markets that will come out of this being major winners and will attract more capital than even companies in developed markets. 
Uh, now, there, will, there is a role of the government, obviously, to figure out how to help those companies in terms of providing the infrastructure, for example, for renewable energy and things like that. But, uh, but I think importantly is uh, it's, a fair, it's, a, it's not a fair world. Uh, it's not a just world sometimes. Uh, the realignment is coming. It's here to go, to stay and to go. And I think it's important for companies to, uh, to adjust to that and, and begin to look at the opportunities. Thank you very much. So, Ayan, I would like to now turn to you. Uh, like Henry just said, in this transition, there will be winners and there will be losers. So, and, and a lot of uh, people argue that as well. So how do we ensure that the system is fully inclusive and that it helps economies in Africa uh, transition to a low carbon economy or a low carbon future and build uh, climate resilience? Okay, this is very interesting. First, thank you very much to, for being in this panel. So first of all, I think we need to look at Africa from the context of what has been Africa's contribution to emissions. It is less than 4%, yet Africa is suffering significantly from the fact that there is uh, the, the rise in global temperature is affecting the entire uh, ocean economy of Africa, the whole blue, and, the, uh, and, and there is a significant part of restoration that needs to be done in our oceans. We are involved in infrastructure, we're involved in mining, we're involved in oil and gas, and we are also involved in the transport. Africa is still 40% uh, without power. We need to look at that carefully. We also need to look at the cost of building things have been very expensive. So the climate resilience money needs to come to Africa. We didn't cause the sea to rise. We didn't cause the, global, the globe to heat up, yet we are being punished. Um, a significant part of the transition requires our resources. Africa is a home to gold, to platinum, to diamond, to also lithium and manganese, which is going to be used in the electrical um, in the electrical uh, mobility. But if we are not able to do mining, if these are not uh, investments that are attracting the right capital flows, it is double unfair for Africa. So I'm going to have to agree with Dr. Hajar and say we need to relook at this. It doesn't mean that we're not doing ESG. ESG, there is a part where it's environment, government, and social, which is the policing part, which is the part that says do no harm. But I think we still have 70% of the population in both the Middle East and in Africa that are very young. And as Dr. Hajar said, these people are leaving the continent to look for jobs, but the jobs are here. The jobs are have to be in Africa. Despite being the, the richest continent in terms of mineral resources, we only get a small fraction of the of the value of our minerals. We have the largest arable land. So I think we need to rethink about this capital migration in such a way that Africa continues to grow, continues to employ, continues to prosper. Again, we are not the big emitter, but we are being penalized by the new capital reallocation while we still need a lot of money to build our infrastructure, to power Africa, to connect Africa, to connect Africa to the rest of the world. So I would say, um, I'm going to have to say, there is a significant real look when it comes to Africa. Young population, huge amount of infrastructure, the brown hasn't been built. We need all the money to come to Africa for this. Thank you, Ayan. Thank you very much. Uh, Rishi, I would like to move to you. And I would like you to please uh, build on what Ayan just touched on, which is the G part of ESG and how that also, uh, I mean, we touched on the environmental aspects a bit, and I would like us to really touch on uh, governance and from your experience working uh, in different parts uh, of Asia and the Middle East and, and in the US as well in so many countries. So how do you see the application of governance standards uh, Deferring in, in different markets so that we incentivize, incentivize uh, more participation and better governance throughout. Yeah, thank you, Avazan. And you know, spot on. Your question is you know, very much uh, relevant in the context in which uh, InvestCorp, as a global investment firm, operates. Uh, and as you pointed out, we are investing capital in North America and Europe which are the developed parts of the world, but also in the emerging markets uh, like India, uh, like Southeast Asia, like the Middle East as well, to some extent. And we realized very early on, Havazan, through our own experience, that it's there is no one-size-fits-all, right? There, it is, it's simply not feasible to take a one-size-fits-all approach to the application 
of ESG in a responsible manner to the investments that we make, where we are looking for our capital to talk, you know, uh, behind our words. And so, you know, if you start with the 17 sustainable development goals and you break them out into, out into the three categories, the E, the ES, and the G part, you realize that the applicability of individual goals in different markets can be very easily determined based on whether you can have a change on the outcomes, right? If you can impact outcomes, that means the, you know, the relevant goal is much more applicable to that market uh, than otherwise. So what we found, you know, just picking up on the point that you made from a G perspective, in markets like uh, North America, for instance, where one can take, uh, you know, uh, business ethics, um, anti-corruption, tax uh, conformance, et cetera, things for granted, you know, you don't really need to expend that much energy on, on that. And instead, you focus your energy from a G perspective to diversity, to inclusion, to equitability, uh, you know, things that we know are clearly areas that need significant attention and clearly improvement in those parts of the world. When you switch to a market like India, as you know, as we have done, we realized actually those very same factors that we took for granted in North America and Western Europe, you cannot, right? In fact, your focus you know, over there is in, is in ensuring that the companies that we invest in to follow best practice from an ethical procurement perspective, from a labor standards and human rights perspective, from the perspective of uh, ensuring transparent disclosure to all stakeholders. So there is, you know, a very good scope over here for active direct investors like InvestCorp and others to make that capital talk, as I, as I said earlier. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Valdez, please go ahead. Yes, I just would like to add that in countries whose core competitive sectors are like of mining and extractive industries, such as blind banking, sector exclusion will further worsen the situation by imposing too heavy burden on certain countries. And this will lead to an even less and less inclusive global value chain, whereby the power is in the hand of a few producing countries. Is this a good for the developed countries uh, to lose the power parity even further in favor of the suppliers? This is uh, very important, really. To... It's, it's a very important point. Thank you. Um, Henry, uh, I would like to turn to you now. Uh, we, we heard um, uh, the, the FII is going to be looking at the different methodologies by which rating agencies uh, rate companies and try to initiate uh, a conversation or, or a system where we could bring more uh, consistency to the ratings, make them more user-friendly, comparable. And that's something we want to work on in the future. But I want to ask you, as someone who's a leader in this uh, space, how do you see the future of rating in ESG? I mean, where does where does the rating where do they need to go to make the ratings? I mean, we, we hear a lot of complaints about ratings being inconsistent, incomparable, not user friendly, hard to understand, to the point that a lot of uh, entities are developing their own rating systems. Uh, and not really depending on these ratings. So how, how do we make these ratings better? What is the future of ratings, ESG ratings, in your opinion? So it's important to recognize that all these ratings are based on uh, two fundamental things. The first one is the data they collect and, and where they collect it from. You know, in our case, uh, about half of the data that we collect is not from company sources, it's from third party uh, sources such as environmental agencies, labor, uh, labor courts, you know, for complaints about, about uh, you know, uh, social issues and, and the like. Um, in many emerging markets, actually, sometimes more than in developed markets, the ministries collect a lot more data than the, the equivalent of those in developed markets. So the problem is that that data doesn't get used. So we are one of the biggest beneficiaries of that, of that data. The second part is the rating is based on a methodology and a lot of the methodology is based on materiality. There will be very different judgments as to what is material on a company. You know, and even if you have an agreement on materiality, the weight of that materiality, how much do you weigh the social issues versus the climate change issues? are going to have a very different 
implication on the rating. So I don't think that there is a silver bullet to bring, you know, all rating agencies to be, uh, you know, conforming to the to similar ratings in every company, like the credit rating agencies, because we are uh, we're starting with different, you know, cloth of of, uh, of data, and secondly, the methodology and the judgments on materiality are going to be different. And I think that choice is very important to investors. I don't think investors should be looking looking for a convergence of ratings uh, and therefore each one of the rating agencies is the same. No, they want more choice. They want richness of information as to the judgments of materiality. Very, very clear. Thank you. Uh, so, Ayan, I would like to turn to you. Uh, how do we, if you could, um, in, in, a, in a very short time, tell us, how do we bring the African perspective to the process of uh, developing universal ESG standards, you know, a movement that is taking place now. So I think um, one thing is that um, I think the COVID has shown us quite a lot, has revealed many things. I think the disruption in the supply chain that has happened had affected Africa significantly. And there is significant move for Africa to really industrialize. And you can do the industrialization in a carbon neutral fashion. You can also um, start connecting Africa within itself because we have over 1.2 billion going on 1.5 billion. There is emerging of certain economies. We do have these resources, but I think the key issue is that I don't think Africa can afford to set, to sell its resources and then it comes back at 15 times the price. Um, as you can understand, that is one of the things that has continued to underdevelop the African continent. So this resource beneficiation and for us to capture more value chain um, from the resources that Africa have will be a trend. Africa has also looked at the whole renewables um, uh, um, uh, basically um, uh, move and many African countries are using renewable sources. In addition to that, Africa provides the world with a huge amount of carbon sinks in terms of the land and the forests that we have. In addition to the fact that we have the largest uh, concentrations of um, battery type uh, resources. We do have oil and gas as well. Uh, gas is still uh, a viable option, uh, but we do need significant amount of funding to support the impact of climate change, which is the resilience. The fact that it takes us to build um, a, a bridge with more money. The fact that we need to, uh, to do our thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rishi, I would like to uh, give you a chance to tell us about your fit for purpose approach. Uh, which I find very interesting to uh, investments and how you apply uh, nuanced uh, ESG metrics to certain markets and certain companies. Yeah, and I'm actually going to pick up from where Henry left off, you know, uh, as he was saying, uh, at, you know, the, the data published by rating agencies ultimately requires a big judgment overlay. And, you know, as a direct uh, private equity investor, we are in the beneficial position, if you will, of being able to do a much more ground up micro analysis and assessment of what are the true material areas that require attention within the overarching umbrella, of course, of the E, and the S, and the G, and then zero in on those material areas where you can actually change outcomes through active intervention and add value to in, in a sustainable manner. So, you know, I'll, again, I'll use India as an example. India real estate, we are investors in India real estate. There, we focus on waste management, energy management, uh, efficient use of land resources. Um, in in uh, the US, where we are also uh, investors in, in real estate, there we focus on ensuring diversity and inclusion, but at the same time, also looking at uh, greenhouse gases, emissions, et cetera, because it's a developed market. So this is the fit for purpose nature of uh, what I was referring to, uh, Vasi. Thank you very much, Rishi. I want to give everyone a chance. We have about a minute uh, or less. So I want to give everyone a chance to just maybe if you want to say a final uh, remark, uh, anything we can action out of this or any ideas you want to share, please go ahead. Uh, Henry. I'll start. Oh, Dr. Bender, okay. I'll start with you. That's okay. Uh, I, I think uh, ESG should be more about value creation and rewarding companies that are leading progress rather than penalizing those with worse 
uh, best lines uh, today. Thank you. I am pleased. I think um, ESG should be about um, really protecting our environment, our ecosystem, having more governance, but it should also preserve investments in the sectors that will create jobs for the continent in, of Africa, at least. Yeah, Henry, uh, Henry, quickly, please. Yeah, I think it's important to be realistic that the world runs on free, uh, free allocation of capital. And therefore, it's, it's one company at a time, one investor at a time, you know. And if those companies want to attract capital, they they gotta, you know, they gotta adjust to the new realities. Thank you, uh, Rashid. Please. I I think I already said it. It's all about making your capital talk in a way that changes outcomes. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure moderating this session. Thank you for your insights and your participation. If there's anything this group shares, is their commitment to making the world a better place. So thank you for your commitment to that and for all your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much of what we have all come to know and understand about climate change and environmental degradation over the past 50 years has come from our growing ability to observe and monitor our Earth from space, from satellites. More recently, technology advancements have enabled us to use satellites to gain insights into the systems and processes impacting our climate and causing environmental damage in unprecedented detail. At the Catapult, we have helped food retailers apply artificial intelligence to satellite-based data to eliminate illegal and unsustainably caught fish from their supply chains. We're working with them now to help them tackle deforestation. We've supported investors in the mining sector and the UN to invoke change around the management of mining waste. Satellite data was used to understand the scale of the associated social, environmental and financial risks at the mine and also at the company level. All of these topics and many more are now coming together under the banner of ESG. We see satellite data increasingly being used to support sustainable financial decision making because of the unique way it provides assurance and validation on top of existing self-reporting mechanisms. Satellite data is an objective source of information. It enables insights to be constructed bottom up and at the level of individual assets, which makes information much more easily comparable between different assets and companies and it's available globally frequently in near real time. Satellite technology continues to advance at great speed and it's clear to me that it offers us all huge opportunity to embed ESG principles into all future business decision making. It's an opportunity that none of us can afford to turn up. And what a great start there. I think the message is very clear. ESG is essential without a doubt, but are corporations taking charge? And who's actually leading this? This is going to be the topic of my panel right now. And we have a two-part series. I'm going to do this one, and we will continue in just a minute after this. So corporations taking charge. Let's take a look at how companies are moving, hopefully, simply beyond complying and actually leading the way. I have a great panel, two great speakers here, so I'm delighted that they're going to join me here. We have the Managing Director and the CEO of Mahindra and Mahindra from India, Dr. Anish Shah is nearby. And here he is, wonderful to see you, sir. And also the Chairman and CEO of Baker Hughes, Lorenzo Simonelli. Lorenzo, great for you to join us also. So, um, you know, I'm really the dynamic duo we have here. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, Dr. Shah, if I may start with you, and when we look at pre-COVID, I mean, I really think people will agree that the world was trying its best to enhance economic prosperity. But what are the challenges now that we're in this sort of post-COVID, soon to be post-COVID recovery? So first, it's a pleasure to be here. I think the biggest challenge for us is to really recognize the fact that the planet is very important. That's something that we've seen through the COVID period. Uh, and the efforts that all companies need to put in will need to be accelerated because consumer expectations are changing. They're looking for a lot more out of their companies uh, where it's not just about making profit, it's also about the planet. 
Now, Lorenzo, let's just take a look at the energy industry because this is at the very heart and soul of what you're doing. Um, it's in transition. The narrative has shifted, but there's still a lot of work to be done. How do you see the industry embracing ESG? And you know, is it doing it the right way and perhaps fast enough as well? Well, great to be with you and um, my compliments to the organizers for uh, setting up this opportunity to discuss a very important topic. And energy transition is definitely happening. And we think that the oil and gas players are key stakeholders in making it a success. Definitely, we need to move faster. And uh, the truth is uh, that to reach the net zero goals that many have put out there, we need to quickly look at actions. And as we look at actions, it's also understanding that hydrocarbons still play a role going forward, but we need to make them cleaner and reduce the carbon footprint of those hydrocarbons. So deploying hydrogen, CCUS, and energy storage and capabilities to reduce the CO2 and also greenhouse gas emissions. And most importantly is the collaboration, collaboration between us to really strive towards those ESG metrics, which are now becoming um, paramount and also standardized across the globe. And so we play a key role, and I think we are moving, uh, but we do need to move faster. Um, Anish, when we look at ESG and we hear, we look at the statistics, and it seems to be adding value to the business. But when you look at it, uh, and perhaps maybe even in an Indian perspective, and also, yes, global, are you thinking it's a good business proposition or is it just a distraction right now? I think a lot depends on whether the view is short term or long term. We've always taken the long term view in our businesses. And from that standpoint, ESG really has been core. If you look back at the history of the Mahindra Group, uh, we launched 75 years ago. And at that point, social and governance were key parts of our foundation. And we've led in the country uh, with very high governance standards. On the environment side, we started our journey 14 years ago. Uh, we've signed up for science-based targets. We've uh, committed to being carbon neutral by 2040, which we're trying to now bring forward to 2035. And uh, there are a series of actions taken, and we've seen tremendous benefits from that. So for us, it's about attracting the right set of employees, uh, talent. Uh, we've seen really values companies like the Mahindra Group. Uh, from a customer standpoint, from a partner standpoint, uh, we've seen, again, tremendous benefits. So ESG is not really a distraction. It's not something that is a checkbox. Uh, it's something core to who we are and what we do. Now, Lorenzo, in the future, I know Baker Hughes is looking to become, and you're on the way, a much more diversified company. So what investments are you considering right now? Well, look, we think it's important that, uh, again, we help multiple industries to uh, decarbonize to reach their goals towards net zero. So we're looking at investments growth from a technology standpoint. Uh, recently, we just uh, acquired a license for a CCUS uh, SRI process. We acquired a company called FreeC Compact Carbon Capture. So we're making the investments on the technology side. Also, we're looking at um, really participating in these new ecosystems. Uh, most recently, we also invested in a hydrogen fund, 5T, that's uh, being out there to deploy projects and infrastructure. So Baker Hughes as an energy technology company is really gonna be enabling the route towards net zero and decarbonizing multiple industries. And that's what we're equipping ourselves for. Anish, when we look, we love to hear, we hear what Baker Hughes is doing. What are you doing? What's your company doing? And I know, you know, when we think about rise and share value, how has this played out? And I see these initiatives that you have, this is not enough, rise for good. I mean, there's so much going on here. But talk to me a little bit about that. So first, on the sustainability front, there are a large number of initiatives. Uh, we are water positive today. We, in fact, generate 12 times the amount of water than we use. Uh, we've got a number of initiatives around energy saving. And as I talked earlier, the science-based targets and the path to carbon neutrality. On the social front, we've really taken a lead in empowering women in India. Uh, we have a program called Nani Kali, which is education for the girl child and for women skilling as well to give them jobs in a variety of sectors. Uh, we've essentially impacted about a million women in India positively and uh, help them get on their own feet and be independent. And as we think about uh, our businesses, uh, we've done a number of things from a business standpoint. Mindra Finance, for example, 
has been able to take 6 million people and be able to create them into entrepreneurs because banks would not lend money to them. And uh, various programs like that have helped tremendously in terms of helping our communities rise. And that's really what the rice philosophy is about. Now, we only have a few minutes. This is the uh, express uh, session that we got here today. So, um, Lorenzo, you mentioned there, you know, how hydrocarbons still very important in terms of we look at really providing energy to the world. It's not going to happen overnight. But a lot of, I suppose, players outside the industry are actually investing, you know, in helping that energy transition. But surely Baker Hughes and companies like yours, you know, have uh, you, you have a higher role to play almost. You're, you're right in the mix. And tell me a little bit about how do you drive change inside the industry? Well, look, you, you have to realize that um, as the population grows, more energy is going to be required. And again, there's a view and a journey that needs to be managed correctly so that there's affordable, sustainable, cleaner energy for people and the planet. And that's really why we need to participate as an energy technology company and also within all the different sectors, hard to abate sectors so that you deploy CCUS, start to build the infrastructure for hydrogen and really move from coal to gas. And again, gas being a transition and also a destination fuel. And if you look at efficiencies as well, and there's been a study made by the IEA, we can actually drive a huge amount of efficiency in our operations today and decrease the carbon footprint. And that's by deploying products that, such as Flare IQ, such as measuring methane. And that's really what we've got to deploy at scale. And so uh, we break it down into what can we do today, how we're managing for the journey ahead, and also the new frontiers. Anish, I have to give you the closing word on this. And sorry it's so quick here, but thank you for such information we've got already. Um, is the Indian government supportive of, in terms of making sure that everybody is on board? What do you say? Uh, the Indian government has taken a lot of steps. Uh, this March, our prime minister articulated energy and environment leadership as one of his overarching goals. And uh, the government is very supportive of a number of other things, especially around renewable energy and uh, making sure that we can meet our commitments to the planet. I have to leave it there, gentlemen, two global leaders, two industry leaders. I'm so happy that you have joined us, and thank you for your great input. There we have Lorenzo Simonelli, the chairman and CEO from Baker Hughes, and Dr. Anish Shah, the managing director and CEO of Mahindra Mahindra. So, gentlemen, thank you so much. So thank it's uh, great to have them on board here. Yes, they had a lot to say here, so we got a lot in there in a few minutes. Coming up shortly, we're going to find out more about ESG in China. Dr. Gu Peiyon, the chairman of Sintao Green Finance, will actually join us. And we've set him a bit of a challenge. And uh, I think keeping up the pace and keeping up the urgency of our message, he's going to do it in 90 seconds and really bring us up to date and let us know what's going on. But first, I'd like to welcome Sarah Cocker. She's going to take over and moderate the second part of the corporations taking charge. So I'm going to just hand it right over to you, Sarah. Well, we're here talking about corporations taking charge, and I'm really delighted that Noel Quinn, the group CEO of HSBC, is joining me now. So welcome, Noel. Thank you, Sarah. Good to be here. And I'm going to kick off because we're talking a lot about performance and, as I said, corporations taking charge. You've had some great results. You've won some great awards last year, and you've clearly defined your net zero commitments. Then COVID hit. Yeah. What did that do to your plans? Uh, COVID threw the whole world into uh, a state of disarray and, and everyone had to react extremely fast to a set of circumstances that I don't think any of us in the world had fully prepared for. Uh, but I'm really pleased with the way my colleagues, you know, 230,000 people in 60 countries around the world responded to that challenge. They provided great support to our customers. You know, in total last year, we were involved in nearly 1.9 trillion of lending or fundraising activity on behalf of clients across the world. Um, they supported each other tremendously well. You know, they had to adapt their own personal lives and to adapt the way they worked. And within the space of two weeks, you know, we had 90% of, of our colleagues around the world having to work from home. And they didn't miss a beat. They did really well. 
Um, but it, it, it's been a challenge for customers in particular. They, you know, their business models have been radically changed over the past uh, 12 months. And of course, around the world, we saw different challenges, particularly in emerging markets, as we're seeing now with vaccines. So how do you see your role as a global company helping drive that inclusion in ESG in those emerging markets? Well, I think uh, the COVID situation was a wake up call to us all and particularly myself. You know, we, we it proved to us just how fragile the global economy is. And, and we've had a massive shock with COVID. Fortunately, vaccines are on the horizon and they're, they're being rolled out. And all credit to the scientists and the health workers that have got us to that situation. We may not be so lucky with the climate crisis. And I think that's the wake up call. A climate crisis may not be reversible. And that's why I think banks, financial services more widely, but also customers have taken on board the need to make rapid progress and catch up on the work that's needed around uh, sustainability. And that's why we published our own quite ambitious target to be net zero by 2050, not just as a bank, but through our customer activity and our financed emissions. We'll be there in 2030 as a bank. I want to be there as a portfolio of customer activity by 2050. And it's, it's central to everything we do now. Yeah, let's pick up on that because uh, we're only as good as the measurements. And yeah. I know that you're, you know, you, you're working within the updated Equator principles now, the World Economic Forum metrics. Are you happy with those global benchmarks or do you think they could go further? I, I think the real job for us now is to take the words net zero and turn them into a definitive framework of what that means for us in the banking sector particularly how do we translate net zero into as an ambition into tangible action into targets in the next five years 10 years and 15 years how do we report against those targets how do we report in a consistent manner so that when one bank reports it looks similar to the way another bank reports that we're not double counting or we're not omitting relevant information and that's the work I'm, I'm also fortunate to be chairing the task force of the financial services sector uh, looking at exactly that how to build the operating methodologies and the framework and the architecture to give transparent consistent meaningful reporting into the market not only of our own activities but of the activities of our customers what is our carbon footprint today and how is it going to move over time? How's that going? It's good. We're um, aiming to publish um, essentially a white paper of how we as a banking sector turn the ambition into a framework of reporting. And we're aiming to do that by the middle of the year as a white paper um, that will set out the, what we believe to be, you know, in, in, in working title terms, the practitioner's guide of how you move from an ambition of net zero into tangible reporting every quarter and every year. Now, of course, we talk very much about the E in uh, ESG. Um, HSBC works across the globe, different jurisdictions, different standards. Um, some have called into question that S in the social in some of your key markets, such as sure. Hong Kong and China. How do you manage that? I mean, we've operated for 155 years in over 60 countries of the world, and each of those countries have very different um, economics, politics, cultural norms. And as an international bank, you have to respect all of the markets in which you operate in, and you've got to recognize you're a guest in all of those countries that you operate in. And first and foremost, what you have to do is to respect the laws of those countries. So you cannot choose which laws to follow or which laws not to follow. And, and what you try to do is to operate for the good of the communities in which you serve. So we, we're serving the communities in all of the markets in which we operate in. And we, we try to make sure we're doing good for our customers, that we're working with the communities and helping them develop. We're trying to foster economic development and we're trying to foster particularly international trade because we know how important international trade is to the economic development of a country. Um, so it's a challenge. It can be very challenging at times, and you would argue it's quite challenging at the moment. But I do believe what we are doing is good in the communities in which we operate in. 
I just want to go to another challenge as well, and it's something you're probably grappling with at the moment, and that's materiality, because it's such a difficult concept. Of course, it's just how far or how important is something for investors for you to abide by that in your ESG guidelines, uh, particularly in sectors like the high emitting sectors. So how do you manage that? Yeah, no, the high emitting sectors are a, a great topic because on the one hand, you would say, well, the banking sector needs to transition away from the high emitting sectors. But my argument on that is that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't help the high emit emitting sectors invent the new technologies to bring down their carbon footprint, to transition their existing business models, whether it's power generation or transportation, to change the way they do business. And what the banking sector should do is to help those sectors transition from their existing technological base, their existing business models, onto business models and technologies that are more compatible with the Paris Accord goals. And that the banking sector should be there to help finance that transition, because that transition is needed for the world as a whole. And us walking away from the old sectors does not necessarily achieve transition. It doesn't achieve the goal of the Paris Accord. And that's why I think we have a very material role to play in providing the finance for the infrastructure that needs to be built to transition industries and businesses from to. And so briefly in your ESG review, you talk about your values, the value, you know, that you value differences, you get things done. How far down the line when you look at what you'd like to get done are you? Well, we published some targets uh, around sustainability about four years ago, three, four years ago, uh, and they were five year targets. And I'm pleased to say we've already exceeded that target. So in that regard, what we committed to three, four years ago, we've already done it. But I also know those targets were not enough. We have to go further. And that's what the next strategy phase of our strategy is all about. There's a huge amount of infrastructure to be financed. I see it as a huge opportunity for the financial services sector. I've quantified that for our own business in the next 10 years at somewhere between 750 billion and a trillion of financing activity that needs to be performed to help companies who are customers of HSBC transition their business models from current technology to new technology. I look at it as a huge opportunity and that's what I now want to move on to and to get that business plan done the way we did the last one. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Noel. Noel Quinn, Group CEO of HSBC. Pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. In State of Green Finance, we publish top 10 ESG trends in China every year. And this year, the top 10 trends capture three major perspectives. Number one perspective is from the policy angle. And we believe that uh, climate change and carbon neutrality goal will be very important for the ESG investor and ESG markets. And we will expect to see more financial institutions in China to adopt TCFD framework to understand their climate risk. The second perspective is from the investor perspective. Basically, two points. Number one is that uh, overseas investor uh, will be more and more interested in the ESG assets in China because it provides uh, a, a, a lower risk uh, assets to them. And number two is the local asset owners. We will see more local asset owners, including asset management, will start to include ESG in their policy framework. And the third perspective is from the market environmental perspective. And we expect to see a well-developed eco ecological environment in China, including ESG rating data provider. And we will also see more university professors doing research in this regard as well. Thank you. And a big thanks to Dr. Gu. Thank you so much for putting it all together there in such rapid uh, and great informative 
uh, style for us. Policy angles, investor perspective, and indeed they're looking at the market environmental perspective. So we'll keep an eye on that. Let's get our poll result up because uh, I know you were busy uh, giving us your uh, opinions here. And again, let's look at ESG standards in terms of what you were thinking there. And absolutely overwhelming. Look at that single standard we need a one global agreement, I think, and this is something that a lot of people have been talking about. And when we see even our final one there, technology, without a doubt, it's driving everything. But C coming in there as well, the data has to be a little bit more transparent. All right, we have another poll for you. Since you're so good at this one, I'm going to leave it up here and just have a look at it there. And this one really is about who's going to drive that transition? Who should be responsible? So take a look here, and will it be the government, regulators, the private sector? We're already hearing lots of commitment from all of the people we're talking to already. What about individual investors? And again, regional uh, institutions, various things like that. So have a look at that there, and have a think, and put your finger on the button there, and we'll get the result of that to you very, very shortly. But in the meantime, we're now going to take a look at the retail investor. And the retail investor been in the news a lot these days. Sarah Cocker is back with two yes, and she's going to be discussing ESG and the retail investor. So I'm going to hand it right over to you, Sarah. So we're really excited to be talking about the retail investor, the next ESG uh, frontier. And I'm lucky to have with me today Isabel Mila. She's head of sustainable investment solutions for global markets at Societe Generale. So welcome, Isabel. And we have Jennifer Wu. She's global head of sustainable investing at JP Morgan Asset Management, formerly of BlackRock Sustainable Investing Team and the Asian Development Bank. So thanks both ladies for joining me today. Thank you. And Hello. Hi. And Jennifer, I wanted to start with uh, this kind of no arguing about the explosion that we've seen in uh, ESG responsible investing in the last few years. But I think the big question is, how do we protect those retail investors in sometimes very volatile markets? That's a great question. Um, I think there is definitely a lot of confusion in the market now with regards to what does ESG actually mean? How is that different from sustainable or impact? The, the reality is there is lack of standardizations on how these funds or pro financial products are being constructed and then also inconsistency across reporting. So I think for in retail investors, one of the most important thing that needs to take place is really around regulation, right? creating a standardized taxonomy on how corporations disclose these types of information so that all players can have access to consistent information and data. And then also a framework around, you know, what would constitute a ESG or sustainable product, labeling rules, et cetera. All of those need to come into play. And I think at the end of the day, it's also about uh, encouraging transparency and disclosure, right, at the individual uh, product level um, as much as we can such that we can help the retail investors to better navigate. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to pick up on that. You mentioned uh, regulation. We've seen the SEC a flurry of new regulations proposed. They're even in, uh, even asking retail investors and the general public to get involved in that. I think the deadline's June. So it seems that they really are taking on board what you just said. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think they're really coming at uh, from two angles. The first one is, as I mentioned earlier, the source of the information has to come from company, right? Because at the end of the day, what we care about is the ESG performance of individual companies, and they are the owner of those data. Um, so there needs to be a um, you know a framework in place such that companies can report and that there is third party uh, auditing agency, for example, to be able to validate those pieces of data, right? So that's a key focus of the SEC to make sure that disclosure starts from the source. And then the, the other lens obviously is once you have that data, you know, as financial services, what do we then do to package those information and, and use those to construct products and, and deliver uh, financial advice to uh, retail investors? What kind of reporting do we then do? Um, I think it was it was last Friday the SEC issued a uh, what they call ESG risk alert, 
right? There seems to be going to be uh, examinations on uh, financial services companies, so asset managers or financial advisors, on you know when they say this product is sustainable or ESG, what's the process in place, their policy uh, reporting, etc. So I think it's all moving to the right direction, and you're you're right, uh, Sarah. Like the SEC is very focused on this now. Yeah, and as well, bringing you into this, because we've seen that some criticise maybe the US was behind the curve, maybe that's why we're seeing uh, the SEC so busy, uh, but in Europe and further afield, they've been a little bit more proactive, should we say, on this front. Well, yeah, we can say that indeed. Uh, I'd even say uh, 2021 and beyond are uh, a watershed moment for ESG regulation in, in Europe. It's quite a, a overhaul and... Um, I'd say uh, these regulations in Europe, uh, they do aim at defining a sustainable taxonomy and, and product categories and uh, couldn't agree uh, more uh, with uh, what uh, Jennifer said. Uh, transparency is key and it all starts with companies and the data they, they report. But uh, for, for uh, customers, especially retail uh, investors, you know, creating a common vocabulary can make ESG more accessible. Uh, second, European regulation will require collecting retail investors' ESG preferences, and then you take them into account in, uh, in investment advice. So think about it, you know, opening a systematic discussion on sustainability with retail clients, that's for sure a driver of, of growth. And then it's our responsibility as product providers to meet that demand with, you know, uh, competitive and transparent investment solutions. Yeah, and how do you do that, Isabel? If we think about products, we think about they need liquid products, obviously. Uh, they need to be customized to what they need. How, how, how is that given in, say, public markets? Well, it's, it's a good point. Often for retail clients, it's you know harder to put savings into a liquid green or social project. So uh, a lot of the solutions uh, rely on public markets. But I'd say collectively in these markets, re retail investors have a huge power. They can choose investment solutions focusing on listed companies which contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And that sends a powerful message and, and shifts you know, large flows uh, towards uh, these companies. But we can accelerate this shift. And to do that, um, we need to, I'd say, complement ESG funds. You know, the goal is to grow the market. Um, it's usually for us a two-step process. First, we offer sort of custom bonds whose performance is linked to specific indices or baskets uh, based on ESG criteria. And second, to your point, uh, we use also risk control mechanisms. So the products you know, meet retail investors' needs like liquidity or capital protection. So it's a way to make it, I'd say, not a why, but a why not question you know, for mm -hmm. them. Why not choose the ESG yeah. product if it offers you know, same or superior capital protection or, or a coupon level? And I think that's key, um, Jennifer, because at GameStop, I know it's not related necessarily to ESG, but it really showed the power of the retail investor. I mean, they were up against the hedge funds, right, squeezing them. Um, and yet they were in a stock that was up 1,600% in one day, and it's off 50% its highs now. So, you know, we've got to be really careful with risk there for the, for the retail investor, because they don't have the platforms, the same access to the same information as, say, an institutional investor. Yeah, I agree. And 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 Isabel made a really good in, uh, important point, which is around consistent messaging and transparency and reporting. I think the the, the situation with GameStop just shows how um, not only uh, retail investors can make a difference, right? Uh, if they are focusing on a particular value that they really think it's important and they can use their own capital to influence how the market moves. But I think it also highlights uh, the other approach of ESG, right? I think historically, when we think about ESG or socially responsible investing, it's really just about excluding companies that you don't like or doesn't align with you, right? The exclusionary based framework. Whereas now, you want to lean in, right? You want to actually reward companies who are doing a good job. You want to lean in investing companies who are transitioning such that you have a seat at the table and you can really push those companies. So I think it's a new way of thinking about using ESG and capital, combining the two to try to create a uh, meaningful impact. Let's pick up on that, Isabel, because obviously we always care about what's next, what's the future trends. So given uh, what Jennifer's talking about, that leaning in, not going for exclusion, what trends do you see in 2021 and beyond for the retail investor? 
It's actually a fantastic segue because indeed, you know, the, the first one is uh, creating a positive impact and then seizing opportunities. You know, initially it was about risk, but now more and more opportunities. And uh, that uh, comes with uh, thematic products. So one example, uh, retail, you know, are more and more aware as consumers and investors alike about environmental challenges. So climate is key, but, you know, there's also now biodiversity or waste management. And when you think that, trillions are being put into green stimulus packages, you know, it makes uh, investing in these sectors both uh, an opportunity to do good and to do well, as you know, the, the saying goes. And that, uh, I'd say, comes with a second trend, uh, which is, again, transparency. And uh, transparency is about the product, how do they work, but not only, it's not just the means, people want to see results. And so really, uh, they'll ask for reporting on like the sustainable development goal outcomes uh, of the of the portfolios, and that will steer the, the future investment decisions. Actually, uh, I had a client who really nailed uh, this demand for tra transparency. She said to me, uh, investors want three things from uh, solution providers, which are tell me, show me, involve me. I think that's a great summary. I'm going to give Jennifer, she's got 30 seconds. What, Jennifer, would you like to see for retail investors in the ESG space in 2021? I think it's really about expressing your preferences explicitly, right? If you have investment uh, via your pension fund, for example, go to your pension fund sponsor and tell them about what is it that you care deeply most about. And, uh, you know, there are so many different ways to invest in companies that can align to what you care about, right? So, the, 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 you know, to Isabel's point, you should ask, right? And I think that's really powerful. If you don't ask, you're not going to be given what you really need. Well, ladies, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Isabel Miller, Head of Sustainable Investment at Societe Generale, and Jennifer Wu, Global Head of Sustainable Investing at JP Morgan Asset Management. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Mohammed Al Hashimi and I work for DP World. We are a global logistics company with a presence in over 60 countries. As part of our long-term strategy, DP World works with local communities where we operate and even beyond to understand what their specific needs and challenges are and together devise a strategy to combat these challenges. We aim to become more than a company operating in a certain place. We aim to become a trusted partner around the world. ESG considerations are embedded within our strat sustainability strategy, governance framework, and risk management practices. Our sustainability strategy is vision-led and goal-driven. It is aligned with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goal, the SDGs, and sets out a clear agenda to spend the next decade delivering against these goals and leveraging our business to achieve a better, more sustainable future for all. We are experts in, the glo in global trade and logistics. It is the core of what we do, but we also seek to be a leader in sustainability. And in order to achieve that, we recognize that monumental action or change cannot happen in isolation. So our strategy is to seek other trusted partners so that we can collectively protect and enhance the life chances of communities and planet. Our partners range from the Blue Marine Foundation, where we educate in the, in the public and work on conserving fragile ocean system, to the Afraj Foundation that aims to empower women and bring about social mobility for the communities. These are just a few examples of the work we are doing to drive sustainability and do our part for people and planet. Thank you. at NYU Stern and delighted to be here with our illustrious panel to talk to you a bit today about preventing greenwashing in a rapidly expanding ESG market. As you all know, we have significant growth in ESG investing and in disclosures globally. We're looking at about 45 trillion uh, in um, assets invested with some type of ESG uh, screen. And we also have more than 90%, for example, of the Fortune 500 companies <coughs> issuing sustainability and ESG reports. There's concerns by regulators about uh, ESG disclosures. We're seeing more and more focus on that in the EU, for example, with non-financial disclosures. Uh, the SEC in the United States is beginning to take a look at this. 
So looking very much forward to hearing from our panel who um, represent exchanges, stock exchanges around the world uh, to get their perspective. Our first question is about um, what are the best practices in preventing ESG greenwashing? I wonder if you can provide specific examples and talk a little bit about what your institution is doing. I thought we would start with Mr. Swift, who is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, Bursa Malaysia Berhad. Welcome. Thank you, Tansi, and a good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think, firstly, there needs to be more granularity with regards to management approach taken by relevant fund managers, as well as actual constituent companies that they, they invest in. Changes to respective portfolios uh, need to be disclosed in a frequent and transparent manner. The approach taken by fund managers around sustainably related expertise and experience of the team or alternative in their assessment, is it in-source or outsource? Um, the engagement priorities of policies for climate change to tax transparency to governance issues, rather than broad sweeping statements that we sometimes see from time to time. Uh, the track record of holding companies to account when it comes to ESG issues, including voting in AGMs, is something that we're encouraging fund managers to uh, for fund managers to demonstrate, and also uh, it's something we've been engaging local institutional investors, such as Malaysia's main pension funds, uh, EPF and Quantman. They have been doing so uh, to tie uh, ESG funds on ESG indices and build on well-established transparent criteria. Being uh, in Malaysia, of course, uh, we are working with FTSE on the FTSE for Good Index. Uh, there's MSCI. I think there's very there's a need to enhance overall credibility of claims that funds are built around ESG. There's a lot of discussion, but we need to be transparent. Actually, show it. Uh, I mean, capital markets around the world, uh, regulators should also draw on clear guidelines as to what is rated as ESG. In a Malaysian context, our uh, prime regulator, the Securities Commission, is working on a guiding principles of SRI taxonomy that we can all then embrace. And then that gives a confidence to the investing public and institutional investors that we are truly ESG-led. Thank you so much. Mr. Odundo, as Chief Executive Officer of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, I wonder if you could share your perspective with us. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, and glad to be here. So from our perspective, I think we must, um, first of all, have this really highly driven at a national level, at a policy level, at a regulatory level, where um, there should be a very clear distinction between uh, sustainable assets and, and, and what they consider non-sustainable, such that we prevent the ability for any greenwashing happening. I think policymakers should also be keen to help uh, direct funds towards sustainable projects. Uh, we think that there's need for more rigor around regulations so that um, uh, sustainable, sustainable assets are very well regulated with very clear alignment to the global reporting standards and all the indicators. Uh, we also see the need for uh, encouragement for impact investing. I think. Um, we, I know we are having a lot of drive to, from conventional investing, having an allocation for impact pro assets, but I think there's a need for a drive towards impact investing, and this will encourage more and more companies to come through. I think overall, uh, it's important to have a very good ESG framework uh, that is well aligned, and uh, more lobbying and engagement by all the stakeholders to align to this framework. And what we've done in Kenya, uh, we did strategically set up something we called um, an ESG framework, a national ESG framework under which uh, our national uh, issuances are being aligned to the green bonds, um, the uh, the sovereign green bonds, and all the assets that intend to 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 raise are being aligned to that. And to build up to that, our companies are now all um, embracing integrated reporting and sustainability reporting as part of the building blocks towards enhancing and creating themselves into very ESG compliance. Thank you so much. And Mr. Roos, uh, Global Director of Capital Markets for the London Stock Exchange, I wonder if you could give us your perspective as well. Thanks, Nancy, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, just you know, picking up perhaps a little bit on what Datuk and, uh, and Jeffrey are saying, I think that uh, issuers and investors uh, really do need um, clear, transparent, robust methodologies um, to, prevent, to prevent greenwashing. And I think that that transparency and that um, and that spotlight is something that really is uh, very very critical. Now, to to make it a little bit more specific, um, we here at um, at Elseg have um, introduced the green economy mark, 
on our London Stock Exchange, where we've got uh, we've actually almost got uh, more than 100 issuers who have signed up and who have qualified for the green economy mark. Um, and here we use uh, FTSE Russell's green revenues data model as the sort of underlying framework uh, to identify companies across our market who generate more than 50% of their revenue from green environmental products and services. And I think it's that, that credibility that comes from uh, a metric-based, transparent uh, methodology uh, backed by something like FTSE Russell that starts to give people the credibility and the confidence to know what they're investing in, uh, which does help us a lot uh, with respect to prevention of greenwashing. Um, other things, things like uh, the sustainable bond market, we have a sustainable bond market where we're doing a similar type of thing. Um, we became the first exchange in 2015 to set up a green bond segment, uh, which allows uh, for issuers with over 90% of green revenues to display their bonds on that segment. Uh, and again, here, we're looking for um, third party reviews, we're looking for third party uh, verification uh, to be provided to really increase the confidence that investors have in the robustness of those metrics uh, and give people the, um, the incentive to uh, sign up to and the, uh, and the confidence to be able to, to invest in it. Thank you. So all three of you have described interesting initiatives in your countries and uh, regions focused on things like standards and principles and ratings. I wonder how do we build a more a collaborative international and cross-sectoral approach to maximize integrity during this growth phase of sustainable investing? What specific needs do you see that need to be addressed to help make your jobs easier, for example? Um, and what type of role should exchanges play in that broader international effort? So maybe I'll, uh, I'll start with our last speaker first. So, all right. Um, yeah, well, uh, just to sort of, to, to, it's perhaps a continuation of the theme really in that I think that um, asset owners and asset managers really do need sustainable uh, data analytics, ratings, uh, indices, et cetera, to support those investment decisions. You know, if you think about what, what, needs, what needs need to be addressed um, uh, to, get that, uh, to get that collaboration and that cross-sectional approach um, working, I think that that is that really where the heart of it is. Um, in terms of the role that exchanges play and the role that we play, um, obviously uh, LSEG, uh, following a recent transaction uh, of uh, Refinitiv, through Refinitiv, you know, we provide a huge breadth and, and depth of that financial data and, and analytics um, in, that, in that space. You know, we have uh, 450 ESG metrics per company across uh, over 10,000 companies. And I think that those data sets really um, provided to customers really do give them the power to do their own sustainability analysis, their own integration. And that, um, you know, that, that really does proliferate across the world and, and allow for that, um, uh, you know, allow for that confidence. Thank so you. I think, you know, that, that's, the, that's the area that we're taking. You know, uh, FTSE Russell as well, one of, one of the other uh, divisions of our, of our business, um, offers uh, sustainability analytics on fixed income, uh, you know, incorporating our beyond ratings uh, analytics. Uh, and so that, that approach in calculating, generating and disseminating uh, analytics data to people across the world is, um, is something that we, is, is the role that we're playing in that, in that space. Thank you very much. Tatuk, what is your uh, perspective on how we build this collaborative international endeavor as well as the role of, of your exchange in that? Thanks, Nancy. I mean, building up Mario was sharing, I think that the primarily, the primary issue at the moment is there are so many different products, be it equity, securities, debt, claiming to be green. But are they truly green? And how do we define green? And uh, I, uh, the exchange, what we what we work towards at the moment is actually driving common uh, by asset class, by investor class, and reaching out to investors. What is it they want to see as a basic? So even before applying analytics to it, what is the real information they need to make an informed decision to decide whether that asset is green or not? Now, as we go around the globe and capital has no barriers these days, we actually need to have a common language that is over and above 
Uh, and I would like to see, you know, there's various initiatives to see congruence amongst different platforms. And I, at the exchange, we are working towards a, very much a bursa. We're a part of that and trying to get a common language between all our exchanges around the world. Of course, working with our friends at FTSE Russell. Uh, but more importantly, I think the key thing is, uh, going beyond that, is the taxonomy that is consistent. So there's also been some discussion developing market versus mature market. Where does it sit? What are the key drivers? And I think this is something we need to, uh, at, at exchange level, we need all to work together and actually engage our institutional investors because rewarding good conduct, uh, people who are truly green, will then embed it and become more and more of what, what we want to see. Thank you. Jeffrey, uh, same question to you, and also I think your perspective on this uh, question that the two raised around emerging economies and, and the approach there would be very helpful as well. So the ESG uh, is now gaining currency uh, in the frontier markets as well, um, especially Africa. And uh, what we've done especially at the Pan-African level, first of all, is to uh, get the exchanges to align to the UN SDG goals uh, through our membership on the US Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. And so we have an association of the African continent and have set up a dedicated uh, committee uh, that drives our sustainability agenda. And so across all exchanges, we are trying to standardize our issuance regulations, our, our guidelines, so that issuers in the respective exchanges clearly understand uh, how to guide their clients when they're placing all these requests coming through. At a very national level, um, our, our, our government is setting up ESG guide frameworks uh, for issuance of, of, for instance, a green as sovereign bond, uh, well aligned to all the international standards and guidelines. But even before we rush into that, we are getting all the experts in to ensure that we are issuing uh, and uh, we are creating an issuance that will meet international standards. Uh, at a very practical level, one of our companies uh, was able to issue a green bond uh, last year, and it was dual listed uh, in Nairobi and London. And a lot of input came from our friends in London, from a knowledge share perspective, structure, ratings, guidelines, and, and that has ensured the success of this issuer that is now going into a third round of capital raise uh, based on that knowledge. So I think it's important to share knowledge, partnerships, and really collaborations to ensure that uh, other regions are able to increasingly get into that. I also want to support data. I think um, the sustainability exchange uh, indices and and as much data is necessary for us to really be able to create uh, products that are really uh, viable and, and, and we'll get rid of the greenwashing uh, that currently takes place. Thank you so much. It's really clear that for all three of you, ESG is becoming very central to the work that you're doing. Um, and I'm wondering if you use your crystal ball looking forward, how do you think the field will have evolved in five years? And what do issuers and investors need to do now to prepare for those changes from your perspective? And uh, Jeffrey, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I think the realization that um, uh, good uh, ESG is, provides very, very good um, uh, insights towards good investments and good practices is, become, is becoming a very um, exciting trend uh, across all all fund managers and across all asset classes. So what I see in the future is that um, a lot of issuers will really be coming out with a specific allocation of assets that are, are basically clearly green. Uh, investors are looking for uh, conventional investors also transitioning a bit more of the allocation to green. And I see that becoming the currency. I see a lot of companies on our exchanges adopting uh, integrated reporting and sustainability reporting because the questions being asked by all the investors is, um, despite the returns you gave, how good, how well are you running your business? So my crystal ball view of the future is that most of our issuers, most of the issuers are going to really adapt to these frameworks and um, we'll see more and more green products coming through uh, to the market. Thank you. The two, what about your crystal ball? Um, I, I, I echo Jeffrey. Uh, <laughs> At the end of the day, uh, issuers, are being, issuers are being told you need to be sustainable. Now, the call to action uh, in, in our market for the large corporates, they've already embraced integrated reporting. They're making the necessary disclosures. 
uh, I'm afraid to say I have a middle market that is yet to embrace. And so at the exchange, for those, for those seeking capital uh, in that middle market segment, they need to see sustainability become embedded and move from being in the mines. Uh, how does one put it? This is probably not quite de rigueur, but if you're an independent director on a smaller listed PLC, you may view sustainability as a cost rather than an investment for the future uh, to, to build your business. You'll just see the bottom, you'll be seeing the impact of bottom line, but not the long-term top line. But as consumers and customers and investors make that demand, uh, in five years' time, you'll be need to be well-placed. Uh, we see our institutional investors already leading the way, making specific allocations for green investments, uh, shying away from brown investments. Of course, interesting conversations about stranded assets, what are we going to do, and so on. Uh, and then I think that's going to be the key. And then what we'll see is greater disclosure and not only just disclosure, but I think we're going to see third-party verification of said disclosure also in the next five years. But that third-party verification will now be at a price point that is acceptable to the majority of the market and will most likely be provided by international service providers. So across the whole value chain, you'll be able to see who you're buying from, are they green or not, and you have providence, and so consumers will be satisfied. Thank you. Murray, how about you? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tansi. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Uh, in terms of the growth of ESG as a market, you referenced the amount of assets that are following ESG in some way at the moment. I think we are going to see the rate of that uh, increase even stronger over the next five years. And so um, I think five years from now, we see a world where uh, we have real dominance of um, the ESG agenda in the asset management uh, industry. And I think that uh, both issuers and investors really do need to prepare for that, uh, what I see is for that eventuality. I think we're well past uh, the tipping point of understanding the, the actual importance of uh, ESG uh, for, uh, from an investor's perspective and from an issuer's perspective. And I think that the acceleration is really happening. Um, from investor's perspective, back to back to data, back to analytics, back to understanding what you're buying, how uh, it, it it impacts um, how it impacts things, and really being educated on um, how you're spending your investment dollars. And then for for issuers, I think it's really important to encourage uh, improved company disclosure. You know, we at LSEG have been a strong supporter of TCFD uh, since its start. Um, you know, following that, that call to action last year between uh, Mark Carney and David Schwimmer, to all the CEOs of the largest uh, exchanges globally, uh, we've convened a coalition of over 20 exchanges to try and develop consistent reporting guidance based on TSFD. Um, and I think that uh, that is going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to get that cross-geographical uh, uh, consistency of standards, which will fuel that further. And I think five years from now, um, the world will be a very, very different place, driven by the actions of issuers and um, the, the voting power of, uh, of investors. Thank you. With our last few minutes, uh, I have a question. So we've done some research. We just uh, published a meta-analysis looking at the last five years of academic research, about 1,200 different studies looking at the correlation between financial performance and ESG. And what we found pretty consistently was on the corporate side as well as on the investor side, uh, you saw outperformance or at least as, as uh, you know, performing alongside of conventional investing, for example. We saw very few studies uh, that found a negative correlation. But this is still an ongoing conversation and I just wonder if anybody has any perspective on that question of performance um, uh, through your own experience, and we'll just open up to anybody who'd like to to jump in. Uh, well, Tansy, perhaps I could jump in and offer something to kick out to the group to start. I think that um, <clears throat> it's interesting the the correlation between longer term performance and ESG. I think is is becoming more and more broadly accepted. Uh, what you're referring to uh, about that concern about making those ESG investments is, to my mind, perhaps a little bit less about ESG versus non-ESG non as it is about short-term versus long-term. 
because we know that frequently we have a short-term investment that needs to be made for long-term gain. And that conundrum in management teams is something that I think is not very well handled uh, across the board, be it ESG um, or uh, technology overhaul. Uh, and I think that quite a lot of the time we have negativity around uh, ESG, that the, the genesis of it is actually in that short-term, long-term um, thinking. Thank I think you. I'll only just Other for a, sec yes, a few sure. seconds on this. Um, what we've seen in our country is that there's a lot of there's a strong correlation actually between good performance and good ESG adoption. Uh, companies that have investors are looking for companies that have good good governance, a strong independent director framework, and that's that's contributing a lot to a positive uh, positive performance of companies. So there's more and more adoption and appreciation of of ESG uh, to drive performance. Thank you. That's too quick. Uh, clearly, at the end of the day, governance governance was the shift that was moving the dial before. We're now moving to sustainability. But I think uh, Murray has hit the nail on the head. It's short-termism versus long-term investing. That's the greatest challenge for our board as they start this journey and navigate sustainability. Um, so, dear investors who are on the call, please think long-term and support companies who are doing the right thing for the future. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate your time, perspectives, and insights, as I'm sure the audience has. And many thanks again to the Institute for bringing us all together. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And a big thanks to Tansy Whelan from NYU and indeed that panel. They're really looking at um, the prospects of avoiding greenwashing and the great prospects that there are out there. And I think you really heard it there. We heard from Murray at the LSE or at the London Stock Exchange Group um, very much talking about that that tipping point has actually happened. And when we look to the longer term, we look to five years from now, we're going to see a very, very different environment. So I think there was out of that too a big call to action to say to people, this is happening, this is real, and actually move forward to it. So again, exciting. Uh, uh, delivery from all of our panel there and really looking at maximizing market integrity and moving forward. So we're going to carry on. We have another panel and um, we're going to look now at the measure of success. And Sarah Cocker is back with us. So I'm going to pass it over to her with her final guest for the day. Sarah. So Jeff Urban joins us now. He's the founder and managing partner of Inclusive Capital Partners, formerly of Value Acts Capital. Uh, thank you very much for joining me today, Jeff. Great to be here, Sarah. Thanks. And um, we're going to kick off a pretty big statement from you. You are your movement to green the world, um, not just run a fund. That's pretty ambitious, just for one guy, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, I was a shareholder only director for 20 years and um, I would say five years ago I started, maybe it was co coincident with the election in our country which was indicative or symptomatic of a have and have not society, but I was um, in, in boardrooms for many, many years and, and the health of the customer, the employee, the planet really didn't come up, it was just the shareholder. Um, low interest rates for the last 10 years have, you know, made shareholder activism really profitable because you can financially engineer, engineer your way to, to good returns. Uh, but again, that wasn't working for the greater good. And um, I started to think there's got to be, and by the way, when you have a, a, an abundant resource like, like, like interest rate, like capital that costs you nothing to borrow, um, there is not a big return attached to financial engineering from here. The, the new constraints were, you know, environmental and social. That's where, that's where things were, that's where the planet was pushing back, for instance. And uh, constraints present opportunities. If you can invest well behind them or into them, you can generate an excess return. So my thinking was that that's where the big long-term returns are going to be to solve these problems, not financial engineer our way to 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 uh, to the answer and and um, 
And then what better way to do it with big public companies? Because that's the system change we seek. You know, I think impact Let's investing. Let's pick up on that because, yeah. you know, like you see the name like Exxon, you know, you've talked about a social environmentally minded fund. People are saying, you know, you need, need to live up to that. And then they see uh, you're linking up with Exxon Mobil. So how, how, how does that marry together? Well, I mean, energy is an essential good. Um, the uh, the idea of carbon avoided versus carbon reduction is starting to finally be understood. You know, renewable energy today is not additional. It doesn't present additionality. It's 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 economic on its own because of the cost curve and photovoltaic efficiencies. Um, and big wind turbines. So to get credit as an asset manager, for instance, for building renewable energy, that is going away. Um, the tough stuff, the really hard stuff, like reducing carbon, is where the next focus is going to be. And when you think about Exxon and the cash flow and the balance sheet and the fact that they have 40% of the global market share in carbon capture over the last 20 years, um, that's, that's a, that's a not business opportunity waiting to happen. Um, you know, the, the let's, let's pick up on that because, yeah. you know, um, when you think about that, like you talk about investment opportunities, given the high valuation of other stocks, maybe in the market, isn't this about reputation management for some of these companies like Exxon, BP, um, because they're going to lose their license to operate. The SEC is closing in on them if they don't do something, um, to, to, to make a change. I mean, the externalities of the of the business are impacting the stock price. Um, that's the opportunity for a value investor. Um, two years ago, three years ago, perhaps you could argue Exxon was over investing in a mature business and the market didn't like it. And I think that's fine. That's fair. Um, just recently, they took their capital spending down by half to a third and they recognized that they are an immature business. Their production profile went flat versus growing. Um, on a prospective basis. And what that does is that A, it gives you confidence that there's going to be a lot of cash flow to redeploy. Um, and, and we really can't do this hard stuff, carbon reduction, without them. We can't do, we need them. So to villainize an industry um, that's essential um, and, and, and maybe even try to quote, put them out of business like the environmentalists would, um, is not productive. We have a, they have a great workforce. They have all this experience in carbon capture, um, tons of experience in hydrogen and biofuels, which are definitely going to need investment to solve this. So I think, you know, once you have a, a stock price that reflects um, as if it's a dying business and you make it a, a growing business, carbon, carbon becomes an investment opportunity in a mature business, carbon reduction. That's the, that's the thing. Buying back your stock is worthless, but being able to reinvest at high returns, as they did many years ago in hydrocarbons, that's a, that's a, that's a revaluation opportunity. And Jeff, just in one word, what was the change you'd like to see to increase that impact in 2021? Um, I, you know, the ESG movement worries me because it's, it's been commodified and pat, it's all passive and it's, it's a way for asset managers and asset owners to own what they always were going to own, you know, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, because they're asset light. Uh, I want a recognition that that those companies that are not already green, but that are greening um, are, and they need a reward system, um, are to be recognized in ETFs. Um, that way we get the system change we want because we get reinvestment. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us today. Jeff Urban, founding managing partner of Inclusive Capital Partners. Wow, that went fast. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Sarah. And fascinating insights there from Jeff Urban, indeed. So let's get back to the results of that poll that you all contributed to and see who do you think is going to lead the transition? Who should be responsible for this? So let's just take a look and see what was on your mind when you pushed the button on that poll here. So who should lead the transition? 
So let's see what we've got. We had good choices there. And, ooh, the government, government and regulators. Okay, but coming in second place there, we do have um, the private sector. We've got lots of commitments today. And then we've got also the regional institutions. So lots of work to be done. And clearly, it's not really anybody's uh, responsibility. In one way, it's everybody's responsibility. It's about bringing every stakeholder into this in terms of what you've been hearing today. So there you've had it, a very rich and information-led uh, two hours of tremendous content from great speakers and great leaders in this industry. And we really hope that you've been engaged, informed, educated, and indeed hopefully inspired to take some action. Now the event is drawing to a close. I've been really happy here and thrilled to be your MC for the day, so thank you all so much. And I want to hand it back now to Richard Attias, the CEO of the FII Institute, because I believe, Richard, you have a little surprise for us, perhaps. Over to you. Thank you, Edney. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edney, for you have been a great, a great MC, really. We really enjoyed listening to you. You brought so much energy. I am here now with Jean-Jacques Barberis. Jean-Jacques is the head of institutional and corporate client coverage and an executive and general management board member at Amundi. So thank you, Jean-Jacques Ving, and bonsoir. I think you are in Paris currently. Bonsoir. Absolutely, Richard. Jean-Jacques, we have a special announcement to make that I'm personally very excited about. But before we reveal the announcement, I would love to ask you a few questions. Uh, first of all, Jean-Jacques, we have heard a lot about the importance of ESG frameworks being exclusive of emerging markets. So how uh, is a European stakeholder like Amundi supporting in this? Yeah, thank you very much, Risha. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I would like to uh, congratulate you uh, also for the title of the event, the content for sure, but the title. I think your Neo Renaissance uh, is perfectly well chosen, uh, particularly in the context where we are. Where we are. Uh, Renaissance was after the Great Plague, and it uh, led to a new conception of the world which was humanism. So I don't, I'm not sure if ESG is the new humanism of the post-COVID-19 world, but I'm pretty sure that ESG is completely going to change the financial in industry. It has started to change it. And to answer directly to your question, I think what we try to do at MND since a decade, and because it's been a decade uh, that we are working on ESG and that uh, ESG is one of our founding pillars, is really to engage into an ESG approach which is inclusive, basically which is trying to incentivize all the stakeholders to do better and at the moment to engage in the transition, notably in the context of our road to Glasgow. So this is what is at the heart of the philosophy of uh, ESG at Amundi. Uh, and in emerging countries in particular, we consider indeed that we need to have, I would say, uh, special developments or attention uh, to the specific situations. This is something that we've tried to work by being innovative in the various number of partnerships, notably uh, with the IFC, the World Bank, uh, for the development, for instance, of green bond markets in emerging countries, but other, uh, I would say, initiatives that we took. But generally speaking, our ambition is to be 100% ESG. That's already what we are, but with an inclusive approach that encapsulates the differences between the different geographies. And so that's why we're very happy to be associated to this event today. Jean-Jacques, since you are in Paris, uh, and of course in France, I would like to ask you a question about uh, the new CAC, the CAC40 ESG index, which was announced a few weeks ago, and it was, I think, launched last month, in fact. So in the context of our conversation here today, do you think the that the inclusions and exclusions make sense. Uh, in other words, I would say, uh, will such an index uh, help further the transition to a green economy? What is your reaction about this CAC 40 uh, uh, ESG? 
Uh, first, we were extremely and we are extremely supportive of the initiative uh, that was led by uh, Stéphane Bougna, the CEO of uh, Euronext, uh, who decided to launch a uh, CAC 40 uh, ESG. Uh, there are some other examples at European level or even uh, at, uh, we'd say, uh, other levels of other indexes that are built now on ESG. But I think the CAC 40 one is, the, is a very symbolic one. Uh, I think, will, will it solve the question of the transition by itself? Probably not. Uh, can it be a milestone uh, in the overall journey for sure? So we think it's quite positive. Coming back to your question on inc exclusion inclusion, basically we consider that uh, the ESG approach uh, shall be inclusive the maximum possible. Again, the idea uh, is uh, to encourage all the companies to engage into the transition and to do better. And I think the CAC 40 ESG is in a way signaling and is a signal vis-a-vis -vis the companies that they need to engage uh, the methodology will evolve. There will be companies that will be in, will be out. So I think it's another tool, another interesting tool to ensure that there is uh, sufficient pressure for all, from all the stakeholders for the companies to engage concretely in the transition. So in a nutshell, uh, we are very supportive of the initiative and we hope there will be more initiatives of that kind uh, in uh, the different stock exchanges in the world uh, following up uh, the leadership of Euronext. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Jacques. So it's now my pleasure to announce the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU between Amundi and the FII Institute. So before signing it, Jean-Jacques, can you tell us more about the content of this uh, MOU, please? Well, first, Richard, uh, thank you very much. I think we're very excited as well uh, to be your partner uh, through this uh, MOU. I think we uh, share one ambition, uh, which is uh, to uh, create, I would say, research, knowledge, uh, and on ESG in emerging markets, because as we discussed together, uh, we believe indeed that we need some approaches that are uh, diversified and different from the geographies. And so, if there is one ambition uh, out of this memo, uh, out of this uh, MOU, uh, it's uh, to uh, contribute to uh, what I would call the intellectual equipment on ESG in emerging countries. So, I think we have a lot of work on our plate uh, to make sure that this uh, intellectual equipment uh, is. Uh, full, uh, but uh, I think this is uh, a great milestone. We're very excited about it, and you can count uh, on all the uh, ESG researchers, uh, resources of MND to engage uh, with you uh, for that purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. So let's sign it now. Thank you. I will send it Thank to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you soon as well. Thank you, Richard. So it's time to conclude now. We are uh, almost at the end of our two hours amazing, uh, amazing uh, virtual series. Uh, I. I would like just to do a quick wrap up. I took some notes about uh, the great conversation which happened during the past two hours. Uh, just a quick wrap up. I think uh, in 2020, what we noticed is that companies that had strong governance structures and responsible social policies have showed greater resilience. This is uh, fact number one. And the second point I noticed is that, however, ESG reliability and uh, usefulness can be further improved by tailoring it to, uh, I would say, local realities at one size fits all approach will not work. The third point that we can keep uh, as one of our takeouts is that varying economic and political realities and developmental uh, needs need to be considered when judging ESG performance. And I think uh, our chairman, uh, His Excellency Yasser Umayyad, made that point also very clear. Another point I, uh, I noticed is that investment companies have a very important role to play in providing the finance for the infrastructure that needs to be built to transition industries and businesses. Another point is that public-private cooperation are definitely essential to drive impact in climate change and sustainability. So PPC is absolutely crucial. And last but not least, the FIA Institute has thus been given today the mission to create and publish a standardized ESG corporate rating methodology as a way to address sustainability challenge. 
So we are taking this mission very seriously. We'll work with first all you to put this rating in place. And uh, I just now would like to thank you for being with us. Thank you, all the speakers. I would like to thank the whole FIA Institute team for the very hard work that you have deployed for the past, uh, I would say, six weeks. And I would like to thank you for being with us very late, even during a Ramadan day. Thank you all. Hope to see you soon, uh, again, very soon. And uh, if not in person, end of October to the fifth edition of the FII. All the best. Be safe. Yeah,